Hello, this is Bryant Myers, and welcome to another episode of Debunking Flat Earth. In this episode, we're going to look at Eric Dubay's recent video. This is going to be a, probably a two-part series. And today we're going to go through the first part of it, where he looks at, again, the parabolic arc of Artemis Orion, again, thinking that it goes into the ocean. But he mentions a couple other things as well that we'll look at. And I've got three little video clips of his that we'll look at, and then we'll come back and discuss and debunk them. So let's get right into it here and let's see what Eric has to say right off the bat. Even though they try to pretend otherwise, the old adage, what goes up must come down, applies to absolutely everything, including NASA's rockets. Every projectile shot straight upwards will eventually begin to arc, form a parabola, and come right back down to Earth, as evidenced by literally every rocket NASA has ever launched. Okay, so Eric doesn't understand basic physics and the idea of orbital motion and escape velocity. So I just kind of wanted to go through a little here because everything that goes up doesn't necessarily come down. I mean, usually it does, but if you throw something or shoot something or fire something fast enough, like uh, Isaac Newton's famous cannonball experiment, eventually you'll get, if you can get fast enough, you can escape the Earth's gravity, but it takes a very, very fast speed to do that. So it's very difficult, but it is possible. So, so that's not correct. Actually, the, the satellites and the rockets that have gone into space have gone into space because there is such a thing as escape velocity, Eric, which doesn't seem to be in your vocabulary. So let's kind of go through escape velocity here. So it's all based on the conservation of energy. So basically, the kinetic and potential energy added together of the initial state is going to always equal the final state. So energy is conserved. This is something that's very has a very deep meaning in physics. So if we want to see how to escape the Earth's natural gravitational field or energy, is what we do is we look at the initial kinetic energy plus potential energy. So that's to say, at what speed, what escape velocity do we need our kinetic energy to be able to get out of Earth's gravitational well? So we have the initial kinetic energy, and we're going to try to solve for this V here and see what the escape velocity is needed. And the gravitational energy the poten in potential form is minus gmm over r. And we're going to take this radius r far, far out to the point where the velocity is zero and the radius is essentially infinity. So basically we're saying at this point out here where the radius is infinity and the velocity is zero, that's basically the velocity that we need to just get past the Earth's gravitational field to where it just stops. Now if we add more velocity than that, then we're basically adding more than needed, even at infinity. And th this might sound far-fetched, but look at Voyager that's outside of our, at our solar system right now. And that is just going to keep going and going and going. So when we solve for V, we end up getting this equation here, which is the square root of 2gm over r. And when we put in our gravitational constant, the mass of the Earth, and the radius of the Earth, because we're starting at r, uh, we're going to get about 11.2 kilometers per second, which is 25,000 miles an hour. So what that means is in order to get completely free of the Earth's gravitational potential energy, or the Earth's gravity, we need at least 25,000 miles an hour if we're going to just shoot something straight up. Now, we'll see this is not the most efficient way to get things outside of Earth's gravity, but it's just a, a good little illustration to see that uh, it's, it's an incredibly high speed to, to get, because the Earth is very massive. So it does take a lot of energy to escape the Earth's gravitational field. If we're not interested in completely escaping the Earth's gravitational field, but we just want to orbit the Earth, this is where Newton's cannonball experiment goes. So that's to say, at what energy or at what speed do we need to shoot something in order for it to stay in Earth's orbit to the point where it's not coming back down, Eric, again, these are two ways in which things don't come back down again. They either escape the Earth's gravitational field altogether, or they remain in orbit around the Earth, basically in a perpetual freefall. And if there's no other forces acting on it, they'll continue to stay in orbit. And now in this equation, all we're doing, this is a little easier, we're just setting the, the gravitational force, gmm over r squared, which is just Newton's law of gravitation, equal to the centrifugal force, which is just mv squared over r. And we just solve for V, we end up getting the square root of gm over r. And it turns out 
that this, this speed is not going to be as much as the escape velocity, but it's still very fast. It's um, uh, here in the case of, depending on how high of an orbit you want, uh, this is, the, I put in the orbit that Artemis was basically going, which is similar to the space shuttle and the ISS orbit, pretty close. You're going to need seven to eight kilometers a second or, you know, 17, 18,000 miles per hour. So it's still fast. Now, what's really interesting is that, and we're going to see an example of this with the Artemis Orion, the capsule, that if you're in orbit and you want to get out of orbit, all you need to do is add 1.41, which is the square root of 2, times your velocity. So, for example, when Artemis got up to 28,000 kilometers an hour, 17,360 miles per hour, the, the translunar injection burn that shot it to the moon needed to basically increase that velocity by the square root of 2. So it had to go from, you know, 17,000 miles an hour upwards to, to roughly 25,000. But it's not exact because it's, it's not like firing a cannonball. You know, it's, it's a sustained burn, so it's not exactly the same thing. But, but the principle is essentially the same, that if you have something in orbit, you're essentially needing to, to increase the speed by roughly the square root of 2 to kick it from an orbital motion into an escape, to escape the Earth's gravity. So I just wanted to kind of address that because a lot of flat earthers don't understand orbital mechanics and they don't think that things can escape the Earth's uh, magic dome or just the Earth itself and that orbits and escape velocities aren't possible. But they're very possible and they're just a very natural consequence of Newton's laws and it's not even really that complicated. I mean, it's a little bit of algebra, but it's not too bad. Now, let's look at the next thing that Eric says, which is he's just going to keep elaborating on this whole parabola thing that the Artemis just, is just going into the ocean or the, or the Bermuda Triangle. Well, let's hear it in his words. These rockets are always shot with their arc facing the same direction, which just happens to be smack dab in the middle of the Bermuda Triangle. NASA says, of course, that the rockets are intentionally making this parabolic course so that gravity can somehow slingshot them into outer space, a completely unevidenced claim, which their fanboys and fangirls just accept without question. Okay, so there's just a lot of things wrong there. Um, almost everything Eric says is wrong, by the way. But um, the first thing is, why are they firing the rockets east? Well, there's a reason, because the Earth is rotating in that direction. So unlike airplanes that stay within the Earth's reference frame, when we fire a rocket to outer space, we want to leave the Earth's reference frame. So we want to go with as much momentum of the Earth's spin as we can. And the way to do that is to fire something east with the Earth's rotation and to do it as close to the equator as possible. So by doing it in Florida, now you could get better by getting even further south, but it's still a good location. You're, you're getting a lot of rotational angular momentum to go in that direction. It really has nothing to do with the Bermuda Triangle being there. Um, I mean, it is convenient that the ocean is there for the, the boosters to fall in, so it won't be out of harm's way, but it's going with the Earth's spin. This is just simple, practical common sense, if you understand just a little bit of how uh, you know, rocket launches and rocket science works. And, and here's another thing that flat earthers don't seem to get, is number one, the Earth is a sphere. So yes, it's going to appear like it's going, and it's going over the horizon because it's, it's not because it's hitting the ground, it's because the Earth is a sphere. And for the same reason that boats, you know, disappear bottom up. You know, things that go over the horizon, they always disappear bottom up. And it's no different with Artemis as it's going around the Earth. And now you can see this image over here. Um, from kind of a perspective effect, it, it is looking flatter than it really is. But, but yes, Artemis is flattening out relatively quickly, but it is going initially up a little bit to kind of overcome the dense air resistance at the surface, but then it wants to get horizontal as soon as possible to get into Earth's orbit. Because if you just shoot a rocket straight up, it's going to lose its energy and it's just going to come back down. I mean, it just makes common sense to get that rocket into orbit and then, to, even Eric said, I mean, to, and you really do want to slingshot it around. He's, he's kind of in a state of incredulity, but you do want to slingshot it around and you want to get it into orbit. And then you, then you time that translunar injection burn just right, as we'll see, and that'll send it off to the moon. 
Um, now, with the Artemis, it's a little more complicated because they were kind of getting it up to a little higher elevation and then coming in close to the Earth, and they, they figured out a way to get the maximum slingshot effect. I'm not using the, probably the correct technical terms here, but, but it is very, very precisely calculated to get the maximum benefit. Again, there's some very, very smart people that are working on this to get this just right. Um, so th again, there's a reason why these rockets are going horizontal and it has everything to do with orbital mechanics and getting that rocket to the moon in the most efficient way possible. So this is all precisely done to, to maximize uh, the amount of velocity that Artemis can have going to the moon with the least amount of fuel possible. And you can see in this image here how it kind of went around the Earth once, and then you can see right here there's a translunar injection burn, and then it, it shoots off to the moon. And here's an image of the translunar injection burn, uh, a graphic, and they actually did get an actual image from the rocket from one of the cameras you can see here. So the next thing I want to talk about, you know, related to Eric Debay saying it just went into the ocean or went into the Bermuda Triangle, which is just ridiculous, is that Astronomy Live actually filmed the Artemis Orion coming back around here. And you can see in this image right here, the Artemis streaking across the screen. And up there at the top, that's actually Mars. He's really, this is highly magnified, so Mars appears bigger than what it actually appears with the naked eye. But you can clearly see this streaking by here. And there's a couple notable things about this. Number one is Astronomy Live was pointing his camera right where NASA said it would be at the time NASA said it would be there. Number two, this is not just an ordinary satellite. It's way too high because it's, it's coming into the Earth's sunlight. And I'm going to show you this frame right here where I, I took some time to go through Astronomy Live's frame by frame. And now he isn't, I don't know how many frames per second he's doing, but, you know, there's a little bit of gap in between here just because of the, whatever the frame rate, because it's going very fast, right? But the thing is, is on, and you can see over here, this is his whole camera frame and he magnified it that Artemis is not coming in. See here, it's not coming in, not coming in. All of a sudden, it, sh it comes onto the screen. And the square here is just what he ended up posting. But then it continues off. But what's happening is, and it's a little bit misleading this angle here, the way he's looking at it, this perspective effect. But this is going to a higher elevation. It's raising up into the Earth's sunlight. And at this time of day, Astronomy Live did all the calculations. It's in a very high orbit, much higher than any satellites would be. So this can't be a satellite. And again, the fact that it's right where NASA said it would be at the time NASA said it would be there is just amazing confirmation. So isn't that just amazing? But it gets even better with what Astronomy Live did. The very next day, he had his tracker on. He's got some very sophisticated software. And again, I'm going to put a link to his video below this video. And he takes you through some of the software and stuff that he has. It's just amazing stuff that he does. But anyway, this little dot here, now this is Artemis. And I've had some skeptical people say, well, how do you know that that's Artemis? Well, a couple things. First of all, this is where NASA said it would be. This is based on NASA's trajectory. Astronomy Live is not circling this image here. This is the software saying this is where it should be, and guess what? It's right there. So again, all this is confirmation to debunk Eric DeBay saying it's just going to the ocean. It definitely came back around. It definitely was sighted the next day by Astronomy Live, right where NASA said it would be. Just because it's kind of cool, one thing I, I just forgot to mention, because, you know, in those memes, some of the memes will say, oh, you missed the moon, right? Well, what they're forgetting to realize is that you're not, we're not trying to aim at the moon at where it's at right now. What NASA's doing is they're trying to shoot Artemis to where the moon will be in three days. And I want to show you this little animation right here, which really drives this point home. So, we're, so again, yes, of course, Artemis, they're not trying to hit the moon. They're trying to slingshot the Artemis Orion around the Earth. 
they're trying to anticipate where the moon will be in three days. And because Newton's laws are so accurate, they can do this very precisely, even without really needing general relativity for the most part. Now, I just want to play this one last little video, then, then we'll kind of wrap it up here. For the skeptical, critical thinkers among us, however, a careful examination of the photo and video evidence proves that this is impossible. The extreme arc and angle compared to the relatively short distance these rockets take on their parabolic course, shows they are clearly coming right back down to Earth. Okay, so what he's kind of showing there is some of the, how NASA does capture some of these capsules sometimes. And let, let me just kind of walk you through what's going on with Artemis 1, 2, and 3 a little bit. So the word Artemis, it's from the Greek goddess who's the twin sister of Apollo, so it's kind of a fitting name to call it Artemis. And Artemis is the umbrella program. So within the Artemis program, you've heard words like SLS, which is the Space Launch System, and you've heard of like Orion. So within the, the Artemis Orion, within the actual rocket itself, the Space Launch, Launch System, the SLS, is basically the big orange thing that you saw take off with all the fuel, and then the boosters on the side, okay? Now, those are disposable, and, and there is a reason. I was watching an interview with someone that worked for NASA, and she's saying that it's advantageous to just drop those to get maximum velocity to the moon. I mean, obviously you wanna drop the boosters, but there is actually a reason why you don't even wanna recover them. And they're actually working on the SLS for Artemis II mission already. It's already in the works. So yes, those are disposable. They're not retrieving those. But when the capsule comes back, the Orion capsule is, is just what you're seeing right now if you see some of the images. That is going to be retrieved. And this is where, of course, the astronauts, I think four astronauts will be able to be on board. And that Orion capsule, you're able to spend up to 21 days, I've read, where four people for 21 days can live just fine in this capsule. But it's, it's some very sophisticated technology. So once that capsule comes back around and hits, it's going to come into the Earth's atmosphere at 25,500 miles an hour, very fast. And, you know, with the parachutes, it's going to hit into the Pacific Ocean. They're going to send a special Navy ship out. But yes, they want to recover that technology. Number one, it's got a lot of information stored on the computers that they're going to retrieve for like images and telemetry data, et cetera, et cetera. And number two, like I said, it's a very expensive technology. So of course they want to retrieve it. And actually what you're going to see is when you see footage of them taking it out of the ocean, it's going to be the Pacific Ocean, not the Bermuda Triangle. So just misleading information from Eric. I mean, pretty much just everything he says there is wrong. And we're going to do one more debunk because this video has some other points and I'm going to do a separate video soon. So thanks for watching this video. Do like this video and subscribe to my channel and, and do leave some comments. I'd love to hear what you think. So thanks again and have a great evening.